Hi, this is Lori Smith, and I'm a member of the St. Clair Shores Yardners since 2011. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the native plants for butterflies and pollinators that uh, I talked about on April 12th, 2021, during our monthly meeting that we have um, speakers at. Um, so the picture you see on the left is part of my garden from my patio table. And then that's a picture of me dreaming about butterflies on the right. Um, I am also uh, a master gardener trainee. I took the master gar MSU master gardener training um, the fall of 2019. And because of COVID, uh, I'm still considered a trainee because um, we were limited with uh, volunteers at volunteer hours because of the pandemic. Um, I've been doing native gardening and pesticide free in my yard for 10 years. Um, I've been raising monarch butterflies and growing plant weed for them uh, for about nine years. Um, I tag them, I've been tagging monarch butterflies for about um, five or six years um, going down to Mexico. Um, they found one of my, uh, my uh, monarch butterflies in February of 2016 up in the mountains of Mexico. And my garden has been featured on the St. Clair Shores Yardner's Garden Tour in 2011. And that's when I joined the group after, after I showed my garden. And then uh, 2019, we had our 25th um, anniversary of the Yardeners group. Um, so they had a couple of our, the members show their yards in 2019. Okay, this is the overview for the meeting. Um, why native plants? So I'm gonna talk to you about why you should, why it's important to plant native plants. Um, right plant, right place. Um, so that's going to talk about um, sunlight and soil and things like that. Then I have a slide talking about soil testing, um, talking about killing weeds and preparing your garden areas. Um, I'll show you some examples of my own yard of how we planned ahead and how it now looks today. Um, then I will talk about, um, I'll have slides of the native plants for Michigan, including our plant sale list. So those will be the first um, few slides. And then talk about um, also some other of my favorite native plants. And then I'll have a slide on native milkweeds. And then the last slide is about resources and contact information. Okay, let's, oops. Okay, so why native plants? Um, you probably have seen, if you've been to any talks about native plants or about growing stuff that has deep root systems, you'd see this image here. Um, and the image over here to the right is an example of turf grass. So you can see this little green square here. Um, that is turf grass. Their root system is very, um, it's a runner root system, but it's a very shallow, uh, root system. So if you live near the lake or near a river, near a stream, something like that, um, if you grow these natives, it'll help prevent your flooding in your yard. Um, so you can see like this is the lead plant. This is a grass called the Indian grass. This is the compass plant. You can see they're probably one of the longer root systems here. Uh, pale purple coneflower, uh, blue stem, that is also a grass. Um, this is bone set, which is a really great native plant for bees and pollinators. White uh, wild indigo, and this is some kind of weed, resin uh, weed. But you can see a lot of the natives have deep root systems. So because they're native, and because they have the deep root systems, you don't have to water them as often. Um, they will soak up the water that's in your ground. They'll go below ground level, uh, water level. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the reason for native plants is to help encourage pollinators and other beneficial insects by planting native plants. Um, we need desperately for them to survive to uh, pollinate our crops. Otherwise our crops are gonna die. Um, a lot of farmers who was using chemicals, dangerous chemicals on their crops have chosen 
to switch and go back to planting native plants around their crops, um, which is helping the pollinators. And it also helps the environment and humans because some of the chemicals they were using on the corn and the soy and stuff are toxic to us. <clears throat> so again, I said uh, native plants have deep root systems. They will help soak up the moisture if you have flooding issues. And I'm a prime example. Um, when we first moved in our house in St. Clair Shores, our backyard used to flood all the time. Then they built, um, we're on a court, so they built some houses that were higher than us. And then our flooding was worse because all the uh, rainwater was running down into our yard. Um, we also, um, you'll see some pictures of us taking down a pool. Um, in the four by fours, um, when we took those out, you could hear the water sloshing. Um, so our water level is about 18 to two feet, 18 inches to two feet down. Um, so our, our water table is very high. We live a block from Lake St. Clair. So um, we had a lot of flooding issues in our backyard and um, having the native plants have resolved that. Um, think about doing a rain garden to divert uh, water away from your house foundation. So people that are you, having problems with, with uh, water seeping into their basement, um, you can take your downspout and bring it out into your yard and have the downspout put the water in by using a French drain, you can uh, bring that into the rest of your yard and um, also have a rain garden. Um, so a lot of these natives like wet feet, meaning they like the wet soil, so they'll soak up that water for you. It also helps clean the storm water before it goes into Lake St. Clair or any lake or river or stream that you live near. Um, do not use pesticides in your native or rain gardens. Um, introduce beneficial insects into your garden instead. Um, ladybugs, if you're not concerned about praying mantis going after butterflies, then uh, praying mantis. A lot of the praying mantis we have are not native to our area either. Um, they were brought in from overseas um, and they've actually chased our native um, species down south farther. So um, there are plenty of uh, beneficial insects to bring introduce to your garden. Uh, right plant, right place. So garden area conditions. Um, what type of areas do you have? That's one of the questions that you should be asking yourself. Um, the other question um, is, do you have full sun, partial sun, full shade, or partial shade? So full sun means that you need at least six hours per day, uh, but some plants such as vegetables really need eight to 10 hours a day, you know, like your tomatoes, your corn, things like that, lettuce. Um, you know, some of your cooler weather plants like lettuce probably doesn't need as much sun, sun, sun or heat during the day. Partial sun or partial shade means that the plant needs three to six hours of direct sun per day. Um, and sometimes you'll see um, when you Google a plant, um, you'll see sometimes uh, that term is used interchangeably. So they'll say partial sun, partial shade. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, don't be afraid to move plants. I move them all the time. If they get crowded or I like to give away plants when I get too many of some kind in an area and I want to thin it out a little bit um, or they're getting too much sun or shade. I had a, uh, uh, a um, reblooming lilac bush uh, that I got during one of our uh, garden tours. We have soliers uh, usually is a vendor at our thing, our garden tour. So I bought this and put it in my shade garden area and it never really grew much. And then when we took the pool down and we moved it, I had it in full sun, it doubled in size the first year I planted it. And, um, you know, it was probably maybe a foot when I first uh, planted it there. And now it's probably about four and a half, five feet and it's big around now. It likes where it's at. So just try to make your plants happy. If they're not happy in one place, move them around. Um, make sure when you do move them that you dig up as much of the root system as you can um, and water the plant well until it's established. 
Okay, soil testing. So I did do the soil testing when I was in the master gardener class and I did it through MSU. Um, you can buy it through, you know, a garden center, one of the big back stores if you want to. Um, the one that the MSU does, does cost a little bit more than the store-bought ones, but they're, it's well worth it because it tells you, you know, your levels of potassium, uh, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, sulfur. It tells you the level of organic materials in your, um, in your soil uh, and what you might need to amend the soil, um, the soil pH, pH and stuff. So uh, one of the, a uh, couple of the questions at the top or one of the questions at the top, um, you know, where, what kind of things are you gonna plant? Are you gonna plant flowers, herbs, vegetables? They all need different pH balances. They all, um, some of them need, need uh, lime or fertilizer to amend the soil. Um, the best time to do a soil test is probably mid to late summer um, so that you get the results back before fall, before the frost, uh, because that's the best time to put the organic material or the chemicals into your yard to, the safe uh, chemicals into your yard to um, bring up the nutrients. Um, I prefer the more natural way. I put um, either compost or when my all my neighbor's leaves fall, I rake them up. My front yard's full of his leaves. So I rake them up and I move them to the back garden and I throw them in my fenced in vegetable garden. Um, so that breaks down over the winter and gives me um, the nutrients I need for my vegetable bed. Um, so that's a bit it on that. Okay, so safe ways to kill weeds. I don't use any weed killer, um, especially the most popular one, uh, uh, because it's dangerous. It's not good for you to breathe in. It's not good for the pollinators. It's killing them off. So um, I don't use any toxic chemicals in my garden. So if you want butterflies and pollinators in your garden, bees, um, flies, whatever, um, you want to make sure you don't use toxic, toxic chemicals because that will kill them. So a lot of people will use vinegar um, to kill weeds in your cracks of your sidewalk in your driveway. Um, my husband, when he mows, he uses the weed whacker uh, for the cracks in the sidewalk and the driveway. Um, sometimes I get down and I weed them to get the root out all the way so I have to keep whacking them all the time. Um, so you wanna make sure if you got weeds that have seeds like dandelions or something like that, um, if you leave the dandelion flowers for the bees in the spring, make sure you get them before they get all fluffy and start blowing away or otherwise you're gonna have more. Um, so you wanna also um, you know, get them before they seed. You wanna make sure you get the complete root. Um, grass has uh, runner roots, like I said, and the roots aren't very deep. So if you want to get rid of a grassy area to start a new uh, garden bed, whether it's a vegetable garden, flower bed or whatever, uh, best time to do that is fall, um, smother the weeds or grass area with cardboard or newspaper. And you don't wanna use color newspaper like um, you know glossy magazine covers and stuff like that. You wanna use the old black and white newspaper. Um, what, what, this is what I clean up or leave in the fall. So, um, in the fall, um, I rake leaves and I throw them into my garden beds. Uh, and why, like I said before, uh, it breaks down over the winter. It adds nutrients to your soil. It's also a good place for our species of moss, uh, caterpillars for moss and other pollinators. Um, uh, the bumblebee, which I just found out recently, um, by disturbing the female, the queen, um, she was putting her, her little, um, nest in the ground cover. I pulled up a weed and she was flying around my head going crazy and, uh, um, never knew they were ground bees. Um, I knew there were some ground bees. I just didn't know it was bumblebees. So if you can leave leaf matter or twigs or something in the ground on the ground in the fall, that's the best. Um, 
even birds like to get stuff out of you know the weeds and stuff in the winter time so if you can leave a little bit of mess in your garden you know you don't have to have a proper you know home home beautiful house beautiful type garden um so i also will leave the seed heads on some of my plants for the birds um especially like the sunflowers the tick seed the um i got a bunch of different uh yellow flowers sunflower family type um coneflower those type of things i leave the seeds on um for the yellow finches i mean in the fall i have got to be 20 or 30 yellow finches just eating my seeds it's cool to watch the little yellows flying around from yellow flower to yellow flower um you will get some reseeding of the plants but if you don't mind please help out the bird population um, if plants do recede then in the spring you can pull out the ones you don't want so thin them out um, just make sure as they're sprouting up you get the whole root system if you don't want them also in the fall i do not cut all my plants down to the ground. I leave my stocky plants like my sunflowers, things that have uh, a hard stem, they're either hollow or they have that foamy material inside of it because there are pollinators, bees and things like that. And um, that will burrow in there and they'll stay in those stalks. Um, so I leave them two to three feet high so they have plenty of room to get down there. Um, it's really important for the pollinators. They'll nest and protect them for the cold winters in Michigan. Um, another slide about planting and planting um, in the fall and the spring. So fall is a great time to plant your spring bulbs, to plant your milkweed seeds. If you plant them in the fall, you don't have to do as much work in the spring. If you wait until spring, um, then you have to cold stratify them, either put them in the fridge or the freezer for a couple of days to break down the seeds. If you just plant them um, in the fall, the cold winter in Michigan will take care of cold stratification for those milk seeds and you'll start getting sprouts the next spring. Um, and they fly around like dandelions, so they don't have to go very deep under the dirt level. Um, native plants, um, is a good time to, to start some native plants. You want to do it probably September, um, you know, so it doesn't uh, get too cold for the native plants. They have to have a little bit of time to get some root system going. Divide plants. So we have a plant exchange, um, usually the third Saturday in September every year in the parking lot behind the St. Clair Shores Library at 11 in Jefferson. Um, I think it's from nine to three, we'll see it on the last slide. And people just bring their plants, they dig up their plants that they wanna get rid of and they either trade them or they just say, take them for free. Um, I've gotten a lot of plants that way. Um, so I also, if I'm gonna move something, that you know, I watched all summer long and I say, oh, maybe it's not doing too good here. I'm gonna move it. So I'll transplant that in the fall too. Um, but I like also to plant the spring bulbs like tulips and things like that, that come up in the spring. Um, so you have other plants um, that will bloom in the spring, um, in summer, I mean. Um, so you have summer bulbs um, that are like your lilies and things like that. Um, those you want to plant um, early spring so that they will come up for the summer, for that summer. Um, also new native plants. So we've used to get our native plants. We used to have our native plant sale in May, but uh, the plants weren't as big as we wanted them and they were pretty tiny. So we started getting them a little later in the year. So we order them at the end of May. The orders are due in May 20th. And our native plant sale is June 12th, Saturday, June 12th. It's usually the second um, Saturday in June. Um, also fall is a great time for planning a garden makeover for the next year. If you're getting rid of grass, 
like I said, then cover early fall with cardboard, newspaper, last resort plastic um, due to environmental concerns. If you do use plastic, make sure you take it up and throw it away properly in your garbage. Um, don't put it in the recycle. Um, it doesn't break down. A lot of the plastic um, material is made with petroleum products. So you want to be careful. Um, like I said, use the cardboard in your garden. It will provide uh, compostable material, kills pesky weeds, grass. Um, it also helps you with a bumper crop of earthworms. I love that. Okay, so here I'm gonna show you um, quite a few pictures of my yard. Um, so when we first moved in, we moved in in November of, two, of 1999. Um, and like I said, we had flooding issues when we came in. Um, this whole area that had the, uh, has a little birdhouse, that's my native area. And then this is the pool deck. And this was all sand back here. They had um, two playscapes back here. It was all sand. I had, um, I forget, I had a lot of like, um, horse weed or whatever it's called um, that's really bad and really invasive so we got rid of that we brought in a little bit more dirt brought our um, soil level up um, and then I just had this was my first native area and I started planting that in like 2011 and um, when I had my uh, and then we put a patio in in 2009. Uh, so we put a 10 by 10 foot patio. We've increased the size a little bit. And then we had, it had this garden here. And then we had the lattice and I would put up some plastic um, like lattice or something or like kind of like chicken wire. But the little rabbits would chew through and get my beans every year. I do have some milkweed here. This is a woodland sunflower and it would get as tall as, it gets about 10 feet tall. I still have it today in the same area. It's a little bit bigger than this. Um, but you can see with the above ground pool, um, we had just a narrow path. And this was one of those winters where it just snowed and stayed cold. And we had feet, I don't know, three, four feet of snow at that point. Um, this is our area and we did have a privacy fence around the whole house around the whole yard and we took that down because we got along real well with our neighbors and i do have three rain barrels on my property i usually store them in the garden upside down this was my original garden again in the little bench we had uh the pool deck um so we had already replaced the liner once in our pool and we were about having to do it again and the walls were starting to deteriorate. So we kept the pool till summer of 2013 because my daughter was graduating and we wanted to have a pool party for her graduation. But I was already thinking what I was gonna do with that big area I was gonna get. So planning uh, and prepping for the new garden area. This was spring 2014. I think this was actually like, um, this picture with the snow on the left was from like our April Fool's Day or our Easter that year. You know how we always get that one last snowfall. And this is as we were starting, we'd already taken the walls down um, and we started taking a po post down. You can see the deck at the back of the house here. And then we started, here's our narrow path here, which we're gonna make a 10 foot wide patio. So I ended up with a 36 foot wide from the garage to my property line to, and back from the house to the back garden path area, uh, 24 feet. So the new patio is gonna be 10 feet wide by 24. Um, and you can see we're starting to make progress here. This was, pro I think it was around beginning of June um, that we put this down. So this is some fabric, uh, landscaping fabric. And then um, that's the middle garden area um, that I'm gonna put my natives in. This is the patio area that 
were next to the garage. And over here with the post is going to be my vegetable garden. And we did leave a couple of the four by fours in. So my vegetable garden is kind of a weird shape because of the way the pool deck went. Um, but we left the four by four. So we had post for, and my husband took them and cut them down because they were, you know, very high. Um, so this is like the first um, summer, what we had. And you can see here's that brick path and more space that we have here for the patio. So um, the first year, I think this might be, this plant here might've been that boomerang um, lilac I moved from the back over to here. This is a Japanese maple that I bought. Um, we moved in spring of 2015. So a year after we cleared out the pool deck. Um, We've been wanting to move this um, because it was kind of crowded by our fence that we had here. Um, it was a beautiful Japanese maple. I bought it <laughs> at English Gardens when we first moved in the house. So it had been um, there and I bought it in like a two, I think maybe a two or three gallon or five gallon bucket uh, at English Gardens for like 11 bucks. And um, so it was there for uh, 15 years, I guess, um, or 14 years. And um, so we decided to dig it out. Um, we started on a weekend. It was spring. It was cold. Then we, we got rain. So we got it dug out. My son came over and helped us. We took this piece of fence down so that we could get at it. Um, then we put it back up, but we burlapped it for a couple days. Um, so I think this was on a Saturday or Sunday. And then my daughter and my husband actually moved it with a cherry picker um, on, on Friday, Thursday or Friday afternoon. Okay. And then we'd already put in that, um, I think it was fall of 2014, my husband finished the the patio. So the patio is 12, 10 feet wide to the from the garage to the other flower bed. So you can see that the holes here. So this was this tree was probably about 12 feet tall when we moved it. And uh, so it's in place. This is it during the summer. So it was happy and it survived and then fall. So you can see it was very happy. My husband, you know, talked me into moving it there because we needed some height. It also ends up giving us a lot of privacy when we're sitting at our patio table from the neighbors. Okay. So again, this was, yeah, I, like I said, I think this was like, um, this was spring of 2015. Uh, we were going to take out this sidewalk here, and then this was the garden fence. And what we did around the garden fence, because we do have rabbit issues, we took um, chicken wire and brought it underneath the fence, out about a foot, um, and then brought it up in the inside all the way back against the railing about halfway up. And then my husband's got um, two by fours down below the railing to keep the score or the the rabbits out also and that works perfect we don't have any rabbit problems coming in here sometimes i got squirrels eating my tomatoes but that's beside the point um and then this is one of my rain barrels here so i got one here i got one back um, at the entrance of our fence where we took the japanese maple off and then i have one bend way up the side of our house. Um, and I use that for my plants. I don't use it in my vegetable garden because the water does come off the roof, off of asbestos sides, uh, uh, shingles. So I don't want those chemicals on my vegetables. So I do use a hose in there. Um, and you can see my plants are taking shape here. Uh, they're starting to get big. This is that uh, balloon, that uh, reblooming lilac. These are probably some sunflowers and woodland flowers and stuff here. And then this is our new sidewalk to the back of our house. Uh, my husband, when he 
knocked out the cement there. Um, he was digging a little bit deeper and found another sidewalk underneath it. So the old sidewalk, this sidewalk here, went all the way back to the back of the house. It was so it was a two layer, um, had a lot of cement to get rid of. Uh, so we hired somebody that was actually putting in a patio for our neighbor and he brought his backhoe and we paid him 75 bucks and he took all the stone away for us. Um, the patio brick we got from Soliers, the other uh, sidewalk brick we get from Home Depot. Um, and then you can see we got kind of a color theme. We use the same uh, stain for our side deck um for our lattice here against the garage and then for our garden fence so it's all the same color and then my husband built me stools um that the um rain barrel sits on and it helps you have to have it at at least 18 inches to two feet high so that you have some pressure for the water to drain out of the rain barrel when when you turn on the spigot okay it's not enough pressure to um you know run a hose on, but it's enough to, you know, fill a couple jugs. I usually save iced tea jugs or something like that. Um, okay. And you see these arborvitaes here. This is, um, so this area back here was my shade garden. Well, spring of 2019, I hear some sawing going on outside. I work from home and I went out and to my surprise, um, they started chopping these trees down. I freaked. Um, only, uh, well, because of my shade garden, um, they didn't tell me that they were going to cut these trees down. They were right, they were in my property line. They were growing in my property line. I wasn't having when they first put them in, but they, you know, I adapted my garden to a shade garden. So now it's going to be full sun all morning, all afternoon. Um, and it was spring so the birds were starting to nest up in here and we get a lot of birds putting nests up here so the guys were nice enough to let me you know make sure before they cut the tree down there was no nest and they were very careful not to um, let the trees fall onto my garden or onto my plants or I have the frame of the gazebo up over here and you can see my rain barrels here but you can see this is spring so I got a bunch of different stalks standing up I leave the stalks like I said for the seeds for the pollinators and it also gives me height in the in the winter so that you can see some height in your garden so you'll see a picture of that too okay so that's the gazebo the stumps were there they did come in and chop up the stumps um this was actually not this picture on the right hand side is actually last summer uh, my neighbor decided to put some sod here he had had rocks here and um like little stepping stones and he took those out and he put sod in and he asked me if i wanted sod and i was gonna say yeah go ahead uh he was gonna pick it up and and then i started weeding this area down here near my beginning of my property and I kept looking and kept looking and I'm going, you know, he has a lawn service. I don't want them spraying chemicals that are going to seep into my garden area. So I changed my mind. I told him I changed my mind. I told him that we would, we had some seed. We put some seed and some straw down for him. Um, so he did that and it's coming in really great there. And I put the landscape fabric again and put the wood chips in so that I have some barrier between his grass and my native plants. Okay. This is a big, huge lilac bush. Um, this lilac tree I got uh, probably one of the first summers, maybe 2000. Um, when we first moved in the house, I, you know, donated to our, for Arbor Day and I got 10 trees. And this was one of the trees that survived. We actually moved it. It was near the side patio of our yard um, and it was getting too big. So we moved it there probably, I don't know, probably 2011. And this patio we put in kind of early when we put the uh, gazebo patio in probably 2009. 
um, the last two winters, we've been putting our patio furniture in the gazebo structure and just putting tarp over it. But you can see this is kind of fall here. Things are, the trees are losing its leaves. And this is how my garden looks in the winter. The, car the cardinals love it. <laughs> the black-eyed juncos love it. And this is my garden with my rain barrels. And you can see I have a lot of height and a lot of uh, things going on in the garden. So almost like enjoying the flowers. I enjoy seeing the plants with the snow on it. Okay, right plant, right place, sun or shade. So again, this was an older picture where the arborvitaes were there. Um, but you can see this is probably late afternoon. I'm getting sun from so, but the back of my property is south. My um, my wide patio and the garage are facing east towards the lake. Um, so this is the west side of the sun coming in past um, my neighbor's house to the side of me. Uh, my little path here. Um, and you can see all my native plants are very happy and very tall. Um, some are 10, 12 feet tall. And then uh, this is a goldenrod and I used it the one year to uh, release my monarchs and they were happy. And this area is my bench and my violet rose. Um, it's a Downton Abbey rose that I got from one of the native garden places. Um, I'll mention them on the last side. I can't think of them right now. This is Ivor, uh, Edelweiss. Um, very pretty flower too. This is my memorial garden to my mom. Uh, her name was Violet. So I planted this rose in her memory. Okay, this is um, one of my gazebos. Um, this is my native garden here. This is before the arborvitaes. So this was an older picture, probably from uh, 2018, maybe 17, 18. Um, and you can see how high these um, sunflower type plants are here. They're very happy. Um, and then I have a lot of different colors going on in my background, in my backyard. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the uh, native plants on our plant sale. So we have the yellow flowers. Um, so zigzag goldenrod. Um, it's a low growing uh, plant, very spindly, kind of zigzags through the landscape. Um, nice filler plant. It will take partial sun, partial shade, two shade. Um, I have it in my front garden bed um, and my side of my house that doesn't get a lot of sun because it's between the two houses. Um, so it does really well. Um, very nice little flower. Uh, very, uh, it behaves well. Um, it likes sand, loam, clay, average to medium soil, soil moisture, uh, height one to two feet. Uh, spread one to three feet, blooms in August, October. So like the fall migrators, um, bees and stuff like that. Love it in the summertime or the fall time. Uh, yellow dainty flowers, thin stem, will tolerate heavy shade, clay soil, has rhizome roots. Uh, nice filler plant, attracts bees and butterflies, deer tolerant. Golden Alexander, great host plant for the Eastern Black Swallowtail Caterpillars. If I run out of dill, dill or parsley, I put them on this plant. They love it. Um, so Golden Alexander doesn't spread a whole lot. Um, mine is just, I mean, I've had that for a couple of years in my garden. It ju I just found a couple little starts in a couple different places in my garden, but that's okay with me. I don't have to put as many wood chips down. Um, full sun, partial shade um two to three feet so it's a low growing plant too it blooms in may june uh yellow dainty flowers thin stem similar to the dill or the queen anne's lace um flower uh same family attracts bees butterflies like i said host plant for the eastern black swallowtail caterpillar um deer resistant 
So if you if you have deer problem, uh, that's one of your plants. Uh, Culver's root, love, 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 love this plant. I've had this in my back garden area for, I don't know, probably since 2011, 2012. Um, it grows three to five feet, sometimes a little taller in my backyard. Um, white um, flowers, and you'll get like five or six things coming up, uh, spikes coming up. Uh, doesn't need to be staked. The bumblebees, as you can see in this picture, love it. Um, blooms, July and September, tracks bees, butterflies, low maintenance, useful in the rain garden. So if you're looking for rain garden plants, that's a great uh, rain garden plant. Fox glove, beer tongue. Um, I don't know if it's just me. When I plant this plant, I always have to kind of stake it up. It likes to droop. Uh, the flowers get heavy and it kind of droops on me. So, uh, but it is deer and drought tolerant, tracks hummingbirds, butterflies, bees, three to five feet, uh, three to four feet, uh, June through to July. Um, this is Penistum uh, digitalis. So digitalis is what they make the heart drug with. So when you're um, using this plant or moving it or planting it, you do want to wear gloves. Um, some people have reported um, reactions like pulse in the heart. So you want to be careful with it. You want to be careful uh, with children around this or, or pets. Love, love this plant. I have this and I've had it probably about eight years. Um, people are starting to use this for landscaping uh, instead of boxwoods and other shrubs. It's a shrub. Um, it dies back down in the fall. Um, so you won't have any uh, fall foliage other than these berries um, but before winter hits it dies down completely and then comes back up the next year uh, spike nard it um, big leaves um, branchy leaves sometimes it will cover my lenten roses so i have to trim that a little bit um, but really easy to trim the branches they're kind of soft um, they get non um, real small little white flowers sometimes they'll be under the leaf so you won't even really notice them uh, but then they start getting these berries so these I think this one's picture is actually from my yard this one I took from websites because I didn't have a big picture of it um, but very nice the birds love it um, so it gets three to five feet high or three to six feet high and it can get probably four feet across in my area full sun to shade so it it loves either um it is in the ginseng family or wild sarsaparilla um so like i said a lot of people are using this for a foundation plant by their uh, house and stuff like that instead of boxwoods or other shrubs very nice plant and native Okay, hummingbirds. Um, so we have two of these plants on our plant sale, cardinal flower and blue lobelia. And this one, I took at Shea Bush Gardens, I think in 2019, you can see a little hummingbird on here. And this one was really tall. This uh, plant was probably, I'd say four to five feet, not just four feet. It was pretty tall. But here's another little picture just to kind of show you that you can plant, plant them close. Um, so full sun to partial shade, uh, you can read the soil stuff, July, August, red attracts hummingbirds, butterflies and pollinators, rabbit and deer tolerance. So if you're looking for something that the deer and the rabbits won't eat, great plant, great nectar plant, uh, great blue lobelia, uh, full sun, partial shade. Um, and again, we do have a culture sheet that are in our plant sale sheet also has the heights on it there too, if you, if you, when you're ordering. Um, July, July, September, blue, purplish uh, flower, uh, attracts hummingbirds, butterflies, bumblebees, deer resistant, ne a great nectar plant. Um, I have all three of these plants in my yard. Uh, actually, I have every plant on the 
plant list in my yard, except for the butterfly weed, but I'm buying that this year. I do have the other native, um, I have um, the common milkweed and I have swamp milkweed too. Um, and that's usually what I find my caterpillars on. I don't typically, well, I don't have butterfly weed, but I'll show you another milkweed that I do have. Okay, so these are lavender kind of blue flowers. Um, so wild petunia. Right now, I'm just growing it in a pot, but I'm going to move it um, because it can get one to two feet high. Um, June uh, through August, lavender, fibrous roots, attracts butterflies. And I just found out recently it's a larval host for a buckeye butterfly. So great plant, just like your other petunias, but um, it's a native plant. Okay, woodland phlox. This is good for sand, uh, shady areas. So I have it in my back area near my lilac tree um, in the shade area. Uh, blooms in May. It's blooming right now. I just was enjoying it today when I was planting uh, a plant up. Uh, blue, kind of purple, light blue, purplish. Um, nine inches to 12 inches attracts hummingbirds, butterflies, deer resistant. Uh, Southern blue flag iris, uh, fold to partial sun, partial shade, two to three feet tall. Um, I have it up against my garden fence on the outside, May through July, blue purplish, uh, deer resistant, great marine gardens, loves wet feet, so great next to streams and ponds. Okay, so this one here, the orange one, this is the butterfly weed. I don't, that's the only plant I don't have in my garden um, on our plant list this year. Um, so it's one to three feet, June to August, orange flowers, small leaves, taproot. So um, it does spread by a taproot, um, only host plant. So milkweed is the only larval host plant for the monarch butterflies. It's the only species of plant that the monarchs will lay their eggs on and that the monarch caterpillars will eat. Other butterflies will visit this. Other pollinators will visit it for the nectar, but this is the only plant species that the monarch butterflies uh, lay their eggs on. So if you wanna raise them, if you want monarchs just to be in your yard and you, you enjoy them, plant milkweed, they'll come. Um, so, uh, the monarch la lays their eggs. The female will lay their eggs. Usually they take their tail and lay them on, underneath the leaf. Um, sometimes in the spring when my milkweed's first coming up, they're putting them on the buds. So they'll put them on the unopened buds sometimes. Um, sometimes they'll, um, as the shoot's coming up, they'll start laying it on the stem. So you got to kind of scrape them off if you want to save the, the eggs and you want to raise them indoors. Um, only host plant species again for them. Uh, monarch uh, caterpillars eat this plant, attracts butterflies, pollinators, hummingbirds, deer resistant. They don't like the, um, a lot of um, animals and birds will not eat this plant because of the milky sap in it. Um, it's toxic or doesn't taste very good. And that's why that's the defense mechanism on the monarch butterfly because they don't the caterpillars don't taste good because they eat, eat the milk sap. Um, so the bird population has learned over the years not to eat those. Um, so that's their defense mechanism. Um, this is swamp milkweed. Love, love this plant. Uh, great. It's great in wetty, muddy areas. Um, it has a root ball. So if you don't want them to spread by rhizome, this is a great plant to buy. The only thing is to get the seed pods off in the in the um, fall, so they don't spread. Um, I do get some caterpillars on here, but not as much as the common because I have the common, they prefer that over the swamp milkweed. And I have more of the common, so they lay their uh, eggs there. Um, so again, this is some soil conditions, three to four feet, um, June through August, pink fragrant flowers. So the milkweed flowers smell so good. Um, and that's what tracks the pollinators and the butterflies to them. Uh, only host plant species, the monarch butterfly lies their legs on. And this again has a root ball. <sighs> Love this plant. 
um, mine were just blooming like crazy this year. And I have this purple color and I have a paler pink one. Um, great fall nectar plant for the bees and the fall migration of monarchs. Um, if we can plant more of this, and they're very pretty flowers and very vibrant purple. Um, so if you love fall flowers, this is a perfect plant for your yard. New England uh, asters, um, full sun, partial shade, uh, clay, sand, loam, three to six feet tall, it blooms from August to October. So again, great plant for the late monarch uh, butterflies migrating to Mexico. Um, fiber, purple, uh, fibrous, uh, purple color with fibrous roots will spread by seed. So they, um, when they do uh, go to seed, they're similar to dandelion. They have like a fuzz to them. So they'll fly off and start more plants. And if you don't care, hey, you got more, more uh, New England aster next year. Um, I did find out that uh, it is deer resistant, attracts birds for the seas in the fall. And it's a harvo host or larval host plant for the purple crescent and the checker spot butterflies. So I didn't know that. I haven't seen any of those caterpillars on my um, plant. Okay, Northern Blazing Star. This is a butterfly magnet. When it blooms in the uh, July, September timeframe, they're all over it, especially the little skippers. Um, and I have this one and I have the other one. I um, love this plant. Very, uh, the leaves are pretty low to the ground and then the stalks come up and they're just full of flowers. Um, full sun, three to four feet tall, uh, July, September, pinkish purple with fibrous root will spread by seed. Again, that, that puffy flower becomes a puffy seed head. Um, so if you don't want the seeds to fly all over, you wanna get the seeds off or the flower buds off before they start really seeding. Uh, butterfly magnet, nectar source in the fall, hummingbirds, birds, tolerates drought, erosion, dry soil, shell rocky so soils. Um, was that? on the, yeah, I guess it was on, okay. These are starting my flowers. So this is the woodland sunflower. Um, the, the branches are kind of scratchy. So like when you put your arm in there to start thinning it out, um, it will scratch you. So wear long sleeves if you're trimming this. Uh, height, two and a half feet to six feet. Um, summer, autumn, yellow spreads by rhizomes, by seeds. Seeds a good source for the birds in the fall and the winter, especially the owl finches. This is one of the ones that the finches are just balancing at the top, trying to get the seeds. Um, this is also in the sunflower family, false sunflower. <clears throat> Full sun, partial shade, um, three to six feet, yellow, spreads by rhizomes, seeds great for the birds. Uh, I have a lot of purple and yellow flowers in my in my yard, as you can see. Um, tall tick seed. Um, this one's really funny because they're so willowy. They blow in the wind and the yellow finches, some, you know, even though they're small, you'll see the branch kind of fall as they get land on it and start eating it. So full sun, partial shade, um, sand, medium wet soil, three to nine feet tall, July to September, small. Um, these are small flowers, tiny, um, probably, I don't know, probably as big as a cap on a medicine bottle or something like that. They're not very big. Little brown centers. Great uh, food source for the birds in the winter, yellow fishes especially. Wild senna. So both of these pictures are wild senna. These are the leaves. It almost looks like a sensitive plant, um, but it has these little flowers with these black little centers. And the bumblebees just love this. As you can see, this bumblebee is getting a lot of pollen on them. 
Um, these little bean things, these are the seed pods. So once the flowers are done, you get these little seed pods. So I save the seed pods in the fall and I share them with friends and family. Um, full sun to partial shade. So this one is actually in my back that used to be my uh, shade garden. So it loves that area, four to six feet. Um, July and August, it blooms yellow, host plant for cloudless sulfur butterflies, bumblebee nectar pollen source. Uh, never found a cloudless uh, sulfur butterfly caterpillar on this plant yet. I'm hoping one of these years. Uh, purple, purple, purple is one of my favorite colors. Uh, Missouri ironweed, love this plant. Uh, purple, deer resistant, attracts pollinators, some moss species feed on ironweed. Beautiful plant. Um, mine does well in full sun or partial shade. I have some in full sun, well, the west facing sun most of the day. And then I have some that's kind of in the shade of my gazebo, um, four to seven feet tall. Very pretty uh, plant. Um, Hori vervain. Uh, like I said, a lot of purple in my yard. Um, I use it to let my butterflies go and kind of dainty flowers and uh, full sun, partial shade, two to four feet tall, June to September, um, pollinators, uh, seeds for the fall, seeds in the fall for the butterflies, larval host for the common but buckeye butter, uh, butterfly. Milkweed, my favorite, the common milkweed. I love, love, love this plant. I love this, even though it's got a taproot, I love it because it's got huge leaves so that it can feed many, many caterpillars. Um, and you can see that the monarch butterfly loves it. The tiger swallowtail, yellow tiger swallowtail also loves it. Um, ne great nectar source. I had these huge wasp on it, these black wasps are almost as big as this uh, bud here. Um, but here is the buds of the flower before they open. And sometimes you got to look on the buds for eggs. And then, like I said, you're going to look underneath the leaves for eggs. That's where the female will deposit the eggs. And this is a pretty, um, one of the last star um, caterpillars, last in star stage. Um, pretty fat guy here, about ready to get ready to spin. Uh, pink huge flowers, um, June and July. Some people call it a firework type blossom because it shoots out. Um, fragrant flowers, when you walk by them, oh my God, they smell so good. Large uh, leaves, only host plant again for the monarch butterflies, um, rhizome root. So if you don't want it to spread, some people will plant it in planters, um, but go with swamp oak milkweed if you don't want it to run. And if you're not raising butterflies, um, world milkweed, I do have this one. Um, and you can see that there's some little pollinator wasp on it. Um, very small little leaves. So I've never seen my caterpillars on this plant, probably because I have the common milkweed and the swamp milkweed. They prefer laying their eggs there. Um, it, the leaves almost remind me of rosemary, very thin type leaves. So I, I don't know how they would survive on that. They wouldn't get enough nour nourishment, um, maybe out in the wild or something. Um, so sun, partial sh sun, uh, rich, wet, muddy soil. So it's great near probably swamps and stuff, one to three feet. So it doesn't get very tall. The flowers are white, almost bluish, a light blue too. At least mine are. Um, small leaves. Host plant again, root ball instead of the rhizome. So if you want some milkweed in your yard, um, you can get this one too. Queen Anne's lace. This was a big flower head with this beautiful female monarch hair. And she looks like a stained glass window. Uh, love this plant. Um, it's been around for decades, decades, centuries. Um, great plant. Um, it is, if nothing else is around, this is a good 
um, larva source for the black swallowtail caterpillars. So if I've run out of parsley or dill, I put them over here on the Queen Anne's lace. I actually um, talk so much about um, caterpillars to my best friend from childhood. And she called me and said, I think I got, she sent me pictures. I think I, I'm pulling out these weeds and I think these are caterpillars. So she sent me pictures and I said, oh, this is Queen Anne's lace. Yes. So she saved one plant in the flower bed and she moved all the caterpillars to that. Um, this is another great plant, Canadian anemone, uh, full sun, partial shade. Um, mine were in partial shade and I wasn't getting much. Now that they're more in full sun back by where the arborvitaes are, they're spreading like a wildflower. Um, they're very low ground cover, white. They're about ready to bloom soon, uh, May to June, white, a hardy ground cover. And again, it's a woodland plant, so it does well in shade but it really thrives in sun also. Um, and it spreads by rhizomes. I love this plant, really nice little flowers. And I love the uh, leaf pattern too. This is another aster. It's a tall flat top aster, um, gets little yellow flowers on it. Um, and again, it blooms late summer, early fall, great nectar plant. Um, not as showy as the purple New England aster, but it is in the aster family, um, two to seven feet tall. And Western Pearly Everlasting. Um, right now I have it in a pot. Uh, I'm probably going to move it because this one will get one to three feet tall. It um, full sun, partial shade. So I have it in the afternoon sun. Um, and it's doing well. Spring uh, blooms spring and summer. It's a little dainty white flower with a yellow center. Um, and it's a host for the American lady butterfly. Other white uh, flowers and plants, uh, mountain mint. This is very, um, mine is about two to three feet tall. It's in partial shade it's in the morning sun and then it gets kind of shaded by the gazebo as the sun goes over um june to september white pollinators love it minty smell so it's next to my gazebo so i can smell a little bit of mint um i've had it in an area just outside my uh, gazebo and it's only spread very little uh nice plant though well behaved uh, very short got these nice little blossoms uh virginia's bower virginia or virgin bowers clematis um this is the only native clematis to our area uh full sun partial shade um the vines can get six to 20 feet tall are wide and tall um i have it right now on my front uh privacy fence um so it's on a little patch of area and last year was the first time it bloomed for me. They are fragrant, but not quite as fragrant as the sweet autumn clematis, which I also have, which is not a native. It's, uh, I think it's originally from uh, Japan or Asia or somewhere. Um, but you can see little dainty flowers. And this is what the flower looks like when it starts to go to seed. It looks like an old man's beard. Um, white slightly fragrant like i said um toxic to ma mammals so um to your to your dog and your cats foliage is often used for nesting for songbirds and pollinators love it this is a very very dainty um geranium so it's a native wild geranium little tiny flowers um probably no bigger than your thumbnail um, the leaves and the stems get kind of red, so it's kind of pretty. It's a low growing forest plant. So I have it in the shade of my Japanese maple in my center garden. So it gets shade most of the day where it's at. One to two feet tall, very pretty, very nice. I love it. Uh, great ground, ground cover. Uh, Sweet Joe pie weed, um, another great pollinator plant. Um, not a host plant, but it is a native plant or a 
a pollinator plant. So they like the nectar. So pink fuzzy, uh, bloom time is summer, four to five feet tall, very nice, full sun, partial shade, uh, pollinators and butterflies. Pink flowers that I have in my garden. Um, so this is the pink maroon. Um, it's called a swamp uh, rose mallow. mallow. Um, huge, uh, like dish or saw, um, like a luncheon plate size um, flower on both of them. This one gets a little taller. It's in more sun um, than the maroon one. The maroon one's in the shade of my Japanese maple. This one's in my back garden. Um, so it gets pretty much full sun. It's near the path to the gazebo. Um, but it they bloom summer and autumn, uh, pink, maroon. Um, the only thing is uh, pests that like to attack, and mostly the lighter pink one because it's out in the sun, is the Japanese beetles. They like to get in there and start eating away at the flower. Um, like I said, they can get three to seven feet tall. Um, this one is a little taller. This one's probably about five feet. This one's probably about two and a half to three feet uh, wide and tall. And they die back down to just dead stems in the fall. Um, so you don't have a bush still in the fall and winter, but they do come back, sprout through the, through the ground. Nice plant, like it. Here are two other blazing stars or yeah, blazing stars that I have in my garden. Um, one is the marsh blazing star, which uh, full sun, both of these take full sun. Uh, they like uh, chalky clay soam. Uh, the marsh blazing star can get three to six feet. The rough blazing star, two to three feet. Um, the bloom time of the marsh blazing star is summer to autumn, purple, butterfly magnet, nectar source in the fall, hummingbirds like it. Uh, this one's similar to that other uh, one that's on our plant list, fuzzy flowers. And you can see all the little skipper butterflies and the bees. And I think there was a oh, grasshopper right here. Um, full sun, dry soil, uh, shallow rocky soil, drought tolerant, uh, October to August to October, butterfly magnet, nectar source in the fall, um, hummingbirds. Uh, these are some pink and red flowers I have. You can see milkweed over here in the front. This is bee balm, scarlet bee balm, uh, Monardia, um, full sun, partial shade, so, well-doing soil, four to seven feet, summer to autumn. Hummingbirds love it, pollinators love it. Um, purple coneflower, uh, Enchinia. This is, uh, you know, they use it for colds and stuff like that. So it's a herbal plant. Full sun, uh, shady, uh, mine does well in the shade too. Uh, clay, well drained, neutral, two to four feet. Um, summer, autumn, purple, pink, attracts pollinators, butterflies, hummingbirds. Seed is a good source. You'll see the finches on here eating the seed heads in the fall. Other natives and non natives. So this is Anis hysop. It's in the mint family. Um, and you get tall little um, bluish purple flowers. It does spread by seed. So, um, and the finches like that seed also. Um, and you can see butterflies like to land on it. Uh, pollinators, especially bumblebees, butterflies, um, and again, in the mint family, one to three feet tall. So it's pretty short. Um, it will grow in sun and partial shade. I had it underneath my uh, Japanese maple. It thrived there too. Kiss me over the garden fence. So this is a non-native. Um, full sun annual. So I'm not a native slob. So I do have some ornamental stuff in there. Um, the Cardinals love the seeds from this very pretty stocky, um, stock, almost like a bamboo stock. Um, and it can get anywhere from four feet. I've had it 10 feet almost to the roof of my side porch. Summer, fall, uh, deep pink. Cardinals love the seed in the fall, annual, not native. Okay. If you leave the seeds on for the cardinals, you'll have hundreds of these in the spring that you'll have to pull. Um, 
but beautiful flowers. Uh, Non-native plants, rose, musk marlow, uh, full sun, will dip to partial shade, two to three feet tall. I love this plant. It's like a, almost like a mini hibiscus. It's got the same kind of flowers as hibiscus. Lacy leaves, pollinators, non-native. Uh, spotted bell flower, it's in the uh, Campanella family. Full sun, partial shade. Um, I have it in the shade of my Japanese maple and it's kind of viney. So I have like a web, um, like a netting that I put the flowers over. Um, and if you deadhead the flowers, you get more blossoms, uh, six to 12 inches tall, June and August, white, uh, pink with purple dots in the inside. So it's kind of whitish pink on the outside and you can see the purplish dots in there. Um, pollinators love it. The bees like to put their little butts in there, uh, non-native. And this is my front flower bed. Um, I just, I had to dig out this rhododendron last fall. Um, I have two rhododendrons over here. These have been in here since we moved in the house, since I got rid of, I had, when I moved in the house, we had these tall, ugly bushes in the front and you couldn't even walk down this little sidewalk. And uh, the first spring, my husband was out of town on business and I went to Home Depot and rented a chainsaw and I chopped these bushes down and then my neighbors helped me with chains and pulled out the root ball. Um, but I was determined, my friend had given me this slate and a Japanese, little ornamental Japanese maple. So that was one of my first garden makeovers when I first bought the house other than getting rid of the sand uh, uh, play yard. Uh, but I ended up putting a red azalea in last week, planted it here because it was empty here without something. But this was uh, spring of last year when my youngest daughter graduated from Wayne State. So um, you can see, I love these. Um, they're in the onion family. So there's alien, these are the big ones. Um, tulips are in here, forget-me-nots are in here, hostas, and then the rhododendrons. And now I, again, where this plant was, I now have a red azalea in here. And then I have a bunch of tulips. I have some woodland uh, poppy in here in the corner by the mailbox. Um, and this is a uh, grape hyacinth here. And then this is one of my Latin roses I took a couple years ago. Um, I took it underneath the flower so I could see the blue sky in the front. So that's really pretty. I like those. Partial shade, 18 to 24 inches, uh, pink, deer, uh, resistant, non-native. Um, and these are the 12 milkweeds, um, native milkweeds. So the butterfly weed is the one on the plant list. Um, swamp milkweed is also on our plant list this year. This is my favorite, the common milkweed. I don't have this one and I don't have this these three in the middle here. Uh, I do have the pokeweed. I don't have the spider or the prairie milkweed, but I have these other ones here, except for this green one. Um, so any of the milkweeds are native um, and they will attract the monarch butterflies for the larvae host. Um, they will also attract other pollinators, bees, wasps, um, other types of butterflies will nectar on the flowers. Okay, um, these are the plants that you wanna plant to save the bees. Um, so herbs like lavender, catmint, sage, cilantro, thyme, fennel, and borage. Perennials, crocuses, buttercup, uh, aster, hollyhocks, anemone, uh, snowdrops are the first flowers to bloom in the spring when the, through the snow. Uh, geraniums, annuals, uh, candela, uh, sweet alyssum, poppy, sunflower, zinnia, uh, clemone, and helotrope. And you can see the bees are all honey. They're ready to make pollen. Okay, so this is the gardener's um, plant list. Um, and you can email us at uh, scsyardners um, at gmail.com. And I'll, I'll have that on the last slide if I got it wrong. Um, but these are pre-order plants. Our, again, our native plant sale is Saturday, June 12th. 
from 9 a.m. to 11 at the Selinsky Greenhouse Museum. It's right uh, behind the St. Clair Shores Library on Jefferson and 11 Mile. Um, you'll will need to wear mask when you pick them up. And um, usually we have some extra plants. Uh, they're $2 for each plant. They're two inch plant pots. So these are all the um, plants that we went through today at the very beginning of the flower list. And then the heights, the scientific names, I'm still getting used to trying to say a lot of these. So that's why I didn't speak, um, talk the Greek uh, names for them. Sun, uh, whether it's full, partial, and you'll see a scale here that kind of tells you F stands for full sun, S is shade, P is for partial sun and partial shade. N next to the plant name means a nectar source. B means uh, birds, seed, or fruit. IH is a uh, butterfly larval host, and HM is hummingbirds. And then here you would put a quantity. So if you get five plants, it's $10, okay? Or if you want 10 plants, it's 20 bucks. Um, so you um, email us, we'll send you the form, or you can go on the St. Clair Shores uh, government website and type in the yarders and you want to make sure you search for the 2021 plant sale form if you go that route. Otherwise, just email us and we'll send you out the, the uh, plant list. And you don't have a lot of time. Um, the plant order is due May 20th. And please note all um, items will be limited to 64 plants, two flats per person. The plants are ordered in December based on the previous year's orders. Nursery uh, can be contacted at wildtypeplants.com. Wild They're up in Mason, Michigan. We've been using them for many years. And this is our um, schedule for the rest of the year. Um, we do send this out in January, uh, but these are the things that are left on our schedule for this year. So the plant sale, is the June thing. August 7th, 9 to 3 is our garden tour and fingers crossed we'll be able to actually have a garden tour this year. Last year we did a virtual video uh, to get you um, kind of interest in the gardens that we we're going to show this year. Um, they were planned to show you last year. Uh, sat Saturday, September 18th is our yard gardeners fall plan exchange where people bring up their plants and, and uh, give them away. And then we have one talk left in October 11th at 7 p.m. And pruning and learn it before you get snippy. <laughs> Funny title. Um, and this is some information regarding the yardeners. And we're also on the St. Clair Shores calendar, our meetings, our monthly meetings. Um, we meet... Uh, just the group usually meets every month on a uh, second Mondays. And then there's usually three or four times that we have speakers in the year. And you can find us on Facebook. Oh, here's the Yardner's email. So scsyardners at gmail.com. So if you email us at that and you ask us to send the plant list and the event list and the culture guide, um, we'll do that. And then this is the uh, culture guide. Let me open that up. Oops. Yeah. So this is the culture guide that you would also get um, that tells you a little bit about each of those plants that we have on our list, what type of soil, vertical stocks, that kind of stuff. Okay. And let me go back here and back here. Okay. And it's, these are the resources that I have. So MSU uh, Master Gardener and other resources. So you can go on their website and um, look for Going Native Can Be Smart Choice in Michigan Landscapes. They also tell you what's good uh, long water areas. Um, and then the Watershed Council Org Rain Gardens. And then this is the information regarding our native plant sale. So that's our next event. So that's uh, June 12th. Uh, please wear masks, social distance, 
And then the other one uh, is September 18th, the plant exchange. And then I forgot the garden tour, but you'll see it on the list. Uh, the garden tour is always the first Saturday in August. Um, and hopefully, like I said, fingers crossed, we'll be all able to meet uh, for the garden tour. And we give them your map, it's five bucks for the tour. Um, and we usually have seven to eight houses on the tour. Uh, wild Types Native Plant Nursery, that's where we get our native plants from. Uh, Macomb County Master Gardener, I just found out, are having their native sale plant this year, September 11th at the Octagon House in Washington, Michigan from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. pre-order only and scheduled pickup times. Um, Barson Greenhouse, um, this is where I've gotten a couple of my plants for butterflies. Um, and the woman, Brenda, that runs the actual green, the butterfly house there, she's, uh, uh, she's the person that got me interested in raising monarch butterflies. And she has written quite a few books and I've gone and listened to her talks great resource she does butter all kinds of butterflies raises them um, moss um, and things like that uh, this is in westland so i grew up on on that side of town and moved to the east side um, over the last 30 years um, but i grew up in Durban heights um, eckerd's greenhouse that's the one i couldn't think of the name of um, that's where i got the uh, Downton Abbey Rose called Violet's uh, Rose, and it's named after Maggie Smith's character in Downton Abbey, if you're a Downton Abbey fan. But Eckerd's Greenhouse is a cool place, too, to get native plants and roses, and they also have a lot of neck, uh, a lot of succulent plants and things like that. And Ray Wiggins, um, I bought a couple plants from them. Um, I bought the yellow bird magnolia. I didn't have a picture of that because we were talking native plants, but um, great plant source too. And then this is my contact information. So my personal email, my garden email is mastergardenlsmith at gmail.com. I have an Instagram account, same um, uh, master gardener, uh, uh, Lori S. And then I have a Twitter account too. And then my memberships are the St. Clair Shores Yardeners, the MSU Master Gardener Trainee, Master Count, uh, Macomb County Master Gardener Association, and Detroit Garden Center uh, Association. And then I am a certified monarch way station and a certified wildlife habitat. Um, and you can go to their websites to find out what you need to be certified. A lot of it's you need, you know, the types of plants that the wildlife like, you need water sources and things like that. Okay. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this talk in person and I probably went into more detail just now. So have a good day and hopefully see you soon. And I will be doing a butterfly talk for monarchs at Roseville Library on July 1st. Uh, time is limited or space is limited in case we have a rain day, we have to go inside. Um, so go to Roseville Library and they will, there'll be a link for the butterfly talk. And then I'm doing a native plant and how to save seeds in the fall for Warren Civic Library, August the 2nd and go on their website to find out uh, when that talk will be available. Thank you and have a good evening.